Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Abdullah Stienkam, and my co-host for this evening will be uh, Tom Makarosi. Thank you for joining us on this lecture two for the CSA level three uh, course. The format of tonight's lecture will be as follows. I will go over the revision questions of last week Wednesday. I will then cover laws 12 and 14. And then I'll hand over to Tom who will cover laws 18 and 19. So to kick off for this evening, I will go through the revision questions of last week Wednesday. So in a three day game, close of play is 1730. Team A hold out at 1722. What happens next? So the law tells us that if an innings ends 10 minutes or less before the close of play time, there shall be no further play on that particular day. And also, we ended eight minutes earlier, that eight minutes shall not be made up on the following day. Question two. Lunch is scheduled to be taken from 12.20 till 1300. Lunch only gets taken at 12.22. At 12.46, the captain of Team A informs the umpires that she is declaring what happens next. So if a captain declares an innings closed during an interruption, or like in this instance, a scheduled interval that is more than 10 minutes, the change of innings interval shall now be incorporated into the lunch interval. Lunch, because it was taken at 12.22, it will now be till 12.00. To 13.02, and the chain of innings will be included in the lunch interval. Question three lunch to be taken from 12.20 till 1300, but the side gets bolded at 12.13. What happens next? Law tells us that if an innings ends 10 minutes or less before the agreed time for lunch, the interval shall be taken immediately and it shall be the agreed 40 minutes duration. So the lunch break will be 40 minutes and shall be from 12.13 till 12.53. And the change of innings interval shall be included in the lunch break. Question four. Lunch again from 12.20 till 1300. But this time at 12.05 it starts to rain and the players leave the field. So what happens next? Law tells us that if the players need to leave the field for any reason with more than 10 minutes remaining before the agreed time for lunch, unless the umpires and captains together agreed to take an early lunch, Lunch shall be taken at the agreed time. So just to emphasize again, if there's no agreement between the captains and the umpires to change the time of the lunch interval, lunch shall be taken at the agreed time of 12.20 in this example. Now we move over to T. So T is from 15 till 15, 1500 till 15.20. Side A gets bowled out at 14.35 after facing 64.4 overs of the allotted 100 overs in the day's play. So what happens next? So the law tells us if an innings ends 30 minutes or less before the agreed time for T, the T interval shall be taken immediately and the change of innings interval shall be included in the T interval. So T shall be from 14.35 to 14.55. And because the change of innings interval 
is taking place during T, no overs will be deducted from the remaining lift in the day. So the remaining overs lift in the day is we started at 100. The team was bowled out in 65 overs. Because we're not deducting any overs, we are left with 35 overs minimum for the day. T again is from 1500 till 1520. The captain of team A declares at 1423 after facing 59.1 overs. So what happens next? So because this is not within the 30 minutes from the, uh, the scheduled T interval, Lord now tells us that if when 30 minutes remains before the agreed time for T, there's already a T, uh, an interval between innings in progress, play shall resume at the end of the 10 minute interval. So we'll, so the team was the, the team declared at 14.23. So now there'll be a, a, 10, a change of innings interval of 10 minutes from 14.23 till 14.33. So the innings of Team B shall start at 14.33 and play will continue until 15.00 when we will take T. That, um, this, on, this will cover three points. To get full marks for this answer, you need to include how many overs left in the day. So in this case, you will deduct three overs for the change of innings interval. And how did I get three overs? The change of innings interval is 10 minutes. And so 10 minutes divided by three is 3.33 something. You round down and you only deduct three overs for the change of innings interval. So the remaining overs for the day is you started with 100. You've bowled 60. So 59.1 was Round it up till 60 and you deduct three for the change of innings. Overs left in the day, 37. So lunch is from 12.20 till 13.00. At 12.17, team A loses the ninth wicket. What happens next? So Lord tells us. So if nine wickets are, are down when lunch or T is reached, you will not take the lunch or the tea interval at the scheduled time. You will delay or you will add an extra 30 minutes to the original tower, to the, to the time. So instead of taking lunch in this example at 12.20, you will play till 12.50 unless a wicket gets taken or the 10th wicket gets taken. So you will extend lunch by 30 minutes unless the 10th wicket gets taken. So if you get to 12.50 and team A is still nine wickets down, then you will take lunch from 12.50 till 13.30. If you take the 10th wicket, for example, at 12.30, then lunch will be taken immediately. Lunch will then be of 40 minutes duration and it will be from 12.30 until 13.10. So that was quickly just revising last week revision questions. So we're kicking off with law 12, and under law 12, we will only cover one particular section. And that section is the last hour of the match. So before I start with this, let's just go through what is the last hour of the match and what is meant by the last hour of the match. So if we take a, a test match as an example, and the same principle apply to whether it's a four-day game or a three-day game, and the starting time for this test match is 10 o'clock, and they play two-hour sessions in test match cricket, so the close of play each on each day will be five o'clock. So when we speak of the last hour of the match, the last hour 
will be the last hour of the game on day five of the test match. So day one, you'll play from 10 till 5, day two, 10 till 5, day three, 10 till 5, day four, the same. So when you get to day five, and when we speak about the last hour, the last hour will only be on the last uh, day of the game. So our close of play in the test match is five o'clock. So the last hour of the match will be from 1600 hours until 1700 hours. So that is mean, uh, that is what the law uh, means by the last hour of the game. So it can only happen on the last day of the match. So whether it's a five day test match or a four day or three day uh, provincial game, the last hour is on the last day of the game. And if the game ends at five o'clock, the last hour will start at 1600 hours. So to, to give you a bit of background of uh, the, the last hour, so for many years, the last hour, uh, the, so on day, let's use a test match as an example. So when you get to day five of the test match, the last hour will start at five o'clock. The uh, umpires will uh, signal by pointing to their risk um, to the scorers and they will indicate the last hour. So the last hour will start at five and continue. And the last hour will start at four and play will continue until five o'clock. But over time, uh, the fielding side on the last day at times, and especially if the batting side was, was, was um, on the verge of winning, they would uh, use slowing down tactics or delaying tactics. And they would slow the game down in the last hour. So the lawmakers decided to stop this slowing down tactics in the last hour of uh, the mostly the fielding side. So they then tweak this law slightly. So how did they tweak this law? They then decided that, and let's be fair to, to both sides. So what they did was, on average, uh, back in the day, uh, the, uh, on average an over will take three minutes. So if the last hour is from four till five, that is 60 minutes. So you should then be able to bowl 20 overs in the last hour. So the lawmakers then decided, to be fair on both sides, that a minimum of 20 overs needs to be bowled in the last hour. So then, the fielding side then have to bowl a minimum of 20 in the last hour. So even if they do decide to bowl a bit slowly, doesn't matter. They have to bowl a minimum of 20 overs in the last hour. So let's say the last hour starts at four and you get to five o'clock and the fielding side has only bowled 15 overs. Or well, even though the official closing um, on day five is five o'clock, play will continue until 20 overs are bowled. So a minimum of 20 overs must be bowled in the last hour. If the fielding side are bowls quickly in the last hour, and let's say at 1650, they've bowled the 20 overs, what happens next? The official cutoff time is seven is five o'clock. The 20 overs was bowled by 1650. The law tells us a minimum of 20 needs to be bowled by in the last hour, but we also cannot end before our official scheduled close of time. So play will in this case continue until five o'clock. So that's just a bit of background on the last hour and how the last hour works and how the lawmakers came to a minimum of 20 overs to be bowled in the last hour. So 
what we're covering in this course is 99% is the laws of cricket. And according to the laws of cricket, 20 overs must be bowled in the last hour or minimum of 20 overs. There are playing conditions for various competitions uh, that have different um, minimums that needs to be bowled in the last hour. But according to the laws of cricket, 20 overs needs to be bowled in the last hour. So the two sections that we're going to cover tonight, uh, that I'm going to cover yeah, under law 12 is, so now we know what the last hour is. So the first is we're going to cover what happens if it's the rain in the last hour and how will we deal with it? That's the first thing that I'm covering under law and the last hour. And then secondly, I'm going to cover the last hour has now started and there is an innings change in the last hour. And I'm going to take you through what the law say, how we deal with if there is an innings change in the last hour. So we will start off by what happens if there's an interruption in the last hour. So the law tells us if there is an interruption of play during the last hour of the game, the minimum number of overs shall be reduced as follows. So the time loss for an interruption, and let's use rain as an example. Rain is a typical example of, of an interruption. Doesn't have to be rain, but let's use the rain for, uh, for this example. So the loss of an interruption is counted from the call of time until the time for resumption as decided by the umpire. So now the last hour has started and now it starts uh, to rain. So as soon as the umpires decided it is now raining and the umpires decide it's time to, to go off and they, and they send the players off the field of play, the umpires need to call time. They need to then write down that time. Once they've called time, they need to write down once the players have left the field. And, and then on, on the resumption of play, so the umpires will then decide when, uh, when the weather clears, what time will we resume play. So from the call of play until that first ball is going to be bowled, that is the time that the umpires need to take into account. And once you've calculated that time, you will lose one over, or one over shall be deducted for every completed three minutes of time lost. So you're only looking at full three minutes of time lost. So in your calculation, you will ignore any fractions, you only looking at every completed three minutes of time loss. So this is the formula or the formula for losing or how to calculate how many overs are left in the last hour if there should be in, in, uh, an interruption is as follows. So you started with 20. You then will subtract if there are any overs that you've bowled. Then you will sub subtract the amount of overs that you've lost. And let's say the last hour started at, six, at 1600 hours. At 1610, players had to leave the field due to rain. The umpires then decided that play can resume at 1630. So how many minutes? Um, how many minutes is that? So we lost 20 minutes. So what does the law tell us? How will we reduce the overs? We will, one over shall be deducted for every completed three minutes of time lost. So we lost 20 minutes. So we'll take 20, we'll divide it by three and we'll get 6.666, but we only will lose six overs. Why only six? Only every completed three minutes of time loss. So in our example, we lost 20 minutes. And let's say, for argument's sake, they've, they've bowled two overs. So you started with 20. 
When we left the field, they pulled two overs. We lost 20 minutes due to rain. So we've now calculated that we need to lose six overs. So 20 minus two minus six. So we now have eight, a 12 overs left of the last hour, a minimum of 12. We were in our revision questions at the end of the session. We do have an example which will illustrate uh, this clearly. Point three tells us once the last hour has started, if there is more than one interruption in the last hour, you will not add up all those minutes. You will, for each interruption, you will do a calculation. So each of the interruption, you will do a separate calculation. Point four tells us if one, if when one hour of playing time remains, if you get to five o'clock and there's already an interruption in progress. So only the time lost after this moment shall be counted in the calculation. Only the time lost after four o'clock you will count in your calculation. If you went off and the, uh, in the middle of the over, that over will be uh, will be completed at um, on the resumption of play, but that over shall not count as one of the minimum overs in the last hour. Point five tells us if the last hour has started and an interruption occurs during an over, on the resumption of play, the over shall be completed and then the two part overs shall between them count as one of the minimum number of overs in the last hour. So just to recap, so in the last hour, once the last hour has started, if there is an interruption, so the last hour you will start with 20 minutes, 20 overs. You will deduct any overs that was bold and you will deduct the amount of overs that you lost for your interruption and, as own, and, only, and only completed three minutes. So you then get to your answer and that is the minimum number of overs to be built in the last hour. In our revision question, there's a nice example that will illustrate how this formula works clearly. So secondly, when it comes to the last hour, what happens if there is an interval between the So what must we do? Firstly, if this interval is already in progress at the start of the last hour, then how would you calculate the number of overs to be bold? If you'd calculate it as the same as if there was an uh, interruption in play. We just handled it in the previous uh, slide. What I do want to focus on is the last hour has started and then there is an inning change. Now, the, if that happens, the law tells us that two calculations needs to be made. And after doing the two calculations, the greater of the numbers in the two calculations will be your minimum number of overs in to be bold in the last hour. So point two is referring to the last hour started at five o'clock. And let's say 15 minutes later, team A gets bowled out. Now there's a change of innings in the last hour. So law tells us that you need to do two calculations to determine how many overs are left in the last hour and the greater of these two calculations shall be the minimum number of overs to be built 
in the last hour. Again, in our revision questions, we do have an example which will illustrate clearly how this works. So firstly, so remember we said here, when an innings ends after the start of the last hour, two calculations needs to be made. So the first calculation that, that we need to do is a calculation that is based on overs remaining. So here the law tells us at the conclusion of the innings, the number of overs that remain to be bowled in the last hour to be noted. Secondly, if your number in bullet point, if your answer in bullet point number one is not a whole number, um, I, I can hear a bit of background noise. Um, can you please mute, mute yourself? Thank you so much. If your answer in bullet point number one is not a old number, you then round that number up to the next old number. You will then deduct three overs for the change of innings interval. And after deducting the three overs, that is will be your number of overs remaining in the last hour. And this is for this particular calculation based on overs remaining. So at the conclusion of the innings, you need to write down how many overs remain to be bowled in the last hour. If that is not a whole number, you round it up to the whole number, to the next whole number, and then you shall deduct three overs for the change of innings interval. And the answer there is your answer based on overs remaining, and you write it down. But remember, there is a second calculation that needs to be made. Again, this is, uh, we're going through the theory part of this. In the revision question, uh, um, there, is a, there is a clear example of exactly how this works, and it will be clear once we go through the revision questions. So this was our calculation based on overs remaining. Our second calculation is based on time remaining. So here the law tells us, so as soon as the innings ended, the time remaining in the last hour needs to be dotted down. 10 minutes for the change of innings interval needs to be deducted from the remaining time. A calculation then to be made of one over for every completed three minutes of playing time remaining, plus one more over if a further part of three minutes remains. So just to quickly give you an example of, just a rough example of how point number four works. And again, when we do the revision example, this will be uh, explained in detail and you will see with the use of an actual example how this work. So your calculation based on time remaining. So the last hour started at five o'clock. So and let's say side A gets bowled out at 16.10. So the time remaining until the agreed time for close needs to be dotted down. So 16.10 was um, side team A was bowled out. Last hour started at 1600. We now have 50 minutes left until un, um, remaining in the last hour. So we've covered bullet point number one. So bullet point number two tells us that deduct 10 minutes for the change of innings interval from the remaining time. So we now sit with, we, we now have 50 minutes um, time left. 10 minutes needs to be deducted. So we're now sitting with 40 minutes left. 
bullet point three tells us that now you need to, we now you sit with 40 minutes left. So how many overs can you bowl in that 40 minutes? So we know it's three minutes per over. So you take your 40 and you divide it three into the 40. And the answer that you get is 13.33. So now bullet point three tells us that there are 30, so you've calculated there are 13 overs left, but if you look at the final part of bullet point three, it tells us plus one more over if a further part of three minutes remains. So we know that if you take 13 and you times it by three, you get only 39 minutes. So there's still a minute left. So the law tells us that you will then add another over. So your answer would be 13 plus one. So you in for your calculation based uh, on time remaining, your answer will be 13 plus one, 14 overs. Again, our revision question will, we will go into a detailed example and it will illustrate how this works perfectly. So that it, that's it for law 12 this evening. Law 14, which covers the follow on. So in a two innings game of, in a two innings match of five days or more, the side batting first needs to lead by at least 200 runs. And if they do lead by at least 200 runs, the captain shall have the option of asking the side to follow on. Doesn't have to, but the option will be available. So five days, if the game is five days or more, the, the lead needs to be at least 200 runs. Not all more day cricket games consist of five days. There are games that are three or four days. There, the minimum lead needs to be 150 runs or at least 150 runs. In a two day game, the minimum lead needs to be 100 runs. And in a one day game, the minimum lead needs to be 75 runs. So the captain needs to notify the opposing captain if he or she wants to take up the option of having the other side to follow on. Once the captain's decided that the other side needs to follow on or not to follow on, that decision then cannot be changed. If the first day's play is lost. So if no play takes place on the first day of a game that of more than one day's duration. How will you determine the follow on target? The follow on target will be determined by the number of days remaining from the start of play. So what is the law trying to tell us here? Let's use the a five day test match as an example. If no play takes place on day one of the five day test match, and the important thing to remember here is no play to take place on day one of the game. So not a single ball was bowled on day one. On day two, everyone gets to the field and plays, uh, play can start on time at 10 o'clock. So, but remember, we've lost, we've lost all of day one. Not a single ball was bowled. So now the law tells us that the follow on target that we need to apply is in accordance to the number of days remaining. 
from the start of play on day two. So in our in our test match, at the start of play on day two, how many how many days are remaining? Four days are still remaining. And what is the follow on target in a four day game? The lead needs to be at least 150 run, that, uh, runs. That is correct. So again, a five day test match. We'll be on day one before the game started. The, uh, the follow on target was at least 200 runs. But because no play took place on day one of the test match, play only started on day two. Your follow on target shall be determined by the number of days remaining. And how many days are remaining at the start of day two? Four days follow on target in a four day um, game is at least 150, 150 runs. Again, just to reiterate, it needs to be the first day needs to be washed out. Let's say for argument's sake, in a five-day test match, play starts on time on day one. So at 10 o'clock, play started on time and, and play continued until close of play at five o'clock. Now we get to day two and the whole of day two gets rained out. And play can only start at, at 10 o'clock on day three. In this case, the follow-on target will still be, this is a five-day test match, so it will still be 200 runs. The point I'm trying to make is day one needs to be washed out, not any of the other subsequent days. Only if day one is washed out, only if no play was possible on day one, then the follow-on target will change in accordance to the number of days remaining. And just lastly, the last sentence here is the day on which play first commences shall count as a whole day for this purpose, irrespective of the time at which play was called. So what this is trying to tell us is on day one, the umpire, the game starts at 10 o'clock, at 10 o'clock, everyone's ready. The umpire calls play. And he's called play, and the bowler is about to start his run up. And he gives one step, and it just takes one or two steps, and then the heavens open, and the players need to leave uh, the field. And it rains the whole day. So technically, not a single ball was bowled on day on day one. So now you get to day two and play starts um, at 10 o'clock on day two. So the law tells us that once play has been called, that is as if play has started on, on that day, even though not a single ball was bowled. But play has technically be was called, so play has started. So you would take that as a day. So even though you didn't bowl a ball, in a, in our example of a five-day test match, day one will still be considered um, as days as play has been taken place. So with the follow-on uh, target will still be, or the minimum lead will still be 200 runs. So as soon as play was called. The as soon as play is called, the uh, that will be seen as play has taken place for that day, and your follow on target will stay 200 runs for that particular game. Tom, I'm now passing the ball to you. That's my portion for this evening. Thank you so much. Thanks, Abdullah, and good evening to everybody.
I'm going to be taking us through laws 18 and 19 this evening, as well as going through revision questions for all the laws that we are covering this evening, laws 12, 14, 18 and 19. After the revision questions, we shall look at any questions in the chat box and then we shall open up the floor to any other questions that anybody might have. Law 18 is scoring runs. And again, just a reminder that we are not going through every single law and even the laws that we do go through. We are only touching on the slides from the master level one presentation that are tested in the level two, sorry, level three exam. So for law 18, we will be covering uh, runs and in particular, short runs. But let's start with what a run is. According to the law, the score shall be reckoned by runs, and a run is scored so often as the batters at any time while the ball is in play have crossed and made good their ground from end to end. Those of you who wrote uh, level two recently will should remember all of these. Runs are also scored when a boundary is scored. And of course, when penalty runs are awarded, there are numerous ways that penalty runs are awarded. But for this particular law, we only need to know that penalty runs do count as runs. What happens if there are short runs when runners or batters are running in between the wickets? A run is short if a batter fails to make good his or her ground in turning for a further run. Although a short run shortens the succeeding run, the latter, if completed, shall not be regarded as short. A striker setting off for the first run from in front of the pop increase may do so also without penalty. Just a quick example on this. The second part of this point number two. David Miller quite often bats outside of his crease to the um, fast bowlers or pace bowlers. And so what the law is saying here is that when David Miller hits a ball or any other batter that stands outside his or her crease, the batter does not have to go back into his or her crease before taking off for the single and that single will be complete as long as he makes good his ground at the opposite end. So now let's watch a video that details um, short runs and specifically detailing unintentional short runs as well as deliberate short runs. There is a big difference between how you as an umpire deal with unintentional short runs and how you deal with deliberate short runs. You were questioned on unintentional short runs in level two exam and in the level three exam you will be questioned on deliberate short runs. So please pay particular attention to the procedure the umpires have to follow when penalizing a batter for deliberate short runs. Um, Abdullah, I'm just going to unshare and reshare with sound and uh, please just confirm or shout if there isn't any sound. If there uh, is, copy that, Tom. Then um, no need for you to intervene. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome to my channel. This video is a new addition to the analysis series. Let's get started. On 15th of November 2018, second day of second test match between Sri Lanka and England, a strange incident happened. Let's watch the footage.
looks like a normal short run case isn't it well that's not the case let's see what umpire's decision was if you did not understand what he signaled he initially disallowed all the runs scored by the batsman on that delivery further he informed the batsman about deliberate short running and awarded five penalty runs to the fielding side now let's see what the cricket law has to say about running short there are two categories in this unintentional and deliberate let's take a look at unintentional short running first if a batsman runs short then the umpire shall call and signal short run as soon as the ball becomes dead and that run shall not be scored for example if they run two and if they run one short then only one run will be scored now let's take a look at deliberate short run cricket law states that if either umpire considers that one or both the batsmen deliberately ran short then wait for the ball to become dead and further disallow all the runs scored on that delivery return the batsman to their original end and award five penalty runs to the fielding side now let's see why the umpire considered this incident as deliberate short running as you can see both the batsmen start running and then striker roshan silva feels that the ball will reach the boundary but upon seeing Moin Ali has stopped the ball he runs back to the striker send but in between the striker roshan silva did not ground the bat at all which made the umpire to consider this as deliberate short run if he had at least tried to ground the bat then most likely that the umpire would not have considered this as a deliberate short run fire and penalty for this feels a bit harsh isn't it now let's see why exactly this law exists In an IPL match between Mumbai Indians and Kings 11 while chasing 231 Mumbai Indians needed 16 runs of the last over Kyren Pollard who faces the first ball of the over strikes the ball and sets off for the run thinking that he can come back for two but upon realizing that he cannot make it he runs back to the striker send without completing the first run and it can be seen that he did that deliberately as he wanted to get back the strike It is clearly unfair as he got one run and also he came back to the strike. To prevent the players from doing such things, this law exists. But in Roshan Silva's case, he was not trying to gain any unfair advantage. But since he did not make any effort to complete the first run, it was ruled deliberate short run. Still have any doubts with this? Do let me know in the comment section. If you like the video then hit the like button and share with all your friends. If you have not subscribed yet then don't forget to subscribe for more such contents. Before we move on to boundaries let me just uh, recap what the narrator said there on deliberate short runs and in the original file that I sent out with uh, all of these slides. Um, the slide is there to show us what exactly needs to happen when us as umpires notice a deliberate short run. Um, we need to uh, disallow all runs to the batting side and the signal there as you saw by Mireille Rasmus was the same signal as dead ball. Uh, we need to return any not out batter to his or her original end. Um, we need to signal no ball or wide to the scorers if applicable. And guys, please always remember this because this is a um, a mark in the exam. Um, we will go through a revision question and you'll see that that line adds to your score. And then award five penalty runs to the fielding side. Uh, note that we don't actually signal short run when there is a deliberate short run. Um, found that quite interesting while going through these slides earlier this afternoon to prepare. 
And then we need to inform the scorers as to the number of runs to be scored. And uh, this is sometimes tricky um, if the scorers aren't exactly aware of the laws as well as the signals that we give. Um, so do try and get the message across uh, via shouting, which is a little bit uh, village. But uh, if you know that the scorers are clued up and when they see you returning the batters to their original ends, they usually know that no runs will be scored. Uh, but just do make sure when you go off the field for the following interval that the score is recorded the correct amount of runs for that particular ball. Note that ball in your notebook after the incident and double check it with the scorers at the next interval. Now we move on to law 19, which is boundaries. And here again, we're only dealing with the specific part of the law. It is the overthrow or willful act of a fielder. If a boundary results from an overthrow or from the willful act of a fielder, how will the runs be scored? The runs shall be scored as follows. Any runs for penalties awarded to either side and the allowance for the boundary, as well as the runs completed by the batters together with the run in progress, if they had already crossed at the instant of the throw or the willful act. This is quite important. It's two things. If they had already crossed, and it's only at the instant of the throw um, that you are interested in. It doesn't matter how many runs and how many times they cross after the instant at the throw, it's at the instant of the throw. Uh, how many times had they crossed in effect is the number of runs that are added to the boundary. Let's watch another video, and this is a famous one of Ben Stokes in the World Cup 50 over final in 2019. Hello and welcome to the Cricket Digest channel. World Cup final match saw one of the most thrilling finish ever witnessed in an ODI match. However, an overthrow in the 50th over of England innings has sparked the debate. A throw from Martin Guptill deflected after hitting Ben Stokes who was diving to save his wicket and the ball crossed the boundary line. Many people were confused about how an overthrow is valid after the ball touches the batsman. Point to be considered here is, everyone in the field including the batsman and the umpire are considered as part of the play and the fielding side has to take this into consideration. Hence, the ball getting deflected from either a batsman or an umpire will not be called a dead ball. However, if a batsman makes deliberate contact with the ball or if he deliberately comes in the way of a throw, then the ball will be immediately called dead and the batsman will be given out obstructing the field. But in the case of Ben Stokes, he had come in the way of throw, but he did not do it deliberately. He was running hard to save his wicket and he did not make deliberate contact with the ball either. It looks unfair to the fielding side in this case, but one should also take into consideration that catching after the ball hits either an umpire or a batsman is valid. Hence, allowing overthrow was well within the loss of the game. But there was a mistake committed by the umpires in this incident. They awarded 6 runs, whereas only 5 runs should have been awarded. According to Cricket Law 19.8, if the boundary results from an overthrow or from the willful act of a fielder, then the runs scored shall be allowance for the boundary, which is 4 runs in this case, and the runs completed by the batsman, plus the run in progress if the batsman had already crossed at the instant of the throw. Ben Stokes and Adil Rashid had completed the first run, but they had not crossed for the second run at the instant of the throw. Hence, only one run should have been awarded for running and in total, five runs should have been awarded. Law further states that if the batsman had not crossed at the instant of the throw, then they should be sent to the end they have left. Meaning, in this case, Adil Rashid should have been sent to the striker's end and Ben Stokes should have been sent to the non-striking end for next delivery. If this law was applied properly, then the New Zealand team would have had a good chance to win the World Cup. 
do you feel any different do let us know in the comment section ladies and gents this is why it's important for us Hello and to know these laws and be able to apply them in the heat of the moment uh, so that we are not caught out and are subject to criticism uh, during or even after the game um, of course we've seen that it uh, happens to the best in the world in terms of mistakes we are all human but please as far as possible uh, know your laws and remember that it is at the instant of the throw how many times had the batters crossed uh, if that's zero then only the boundary counts if that's one then it's one plus the boundary four and if it's they've crossed twice then it's two plus the boundary four okay so quick recap on the world cup final that should have been one for the running and four for the boundary uh, should only have been five and Adil Rashid should have faced the next ball and not Ben Stokes um, but of course it created a hell of a lot of theater on the day and the, that game still goes down probably as the uh, best uh, 50 over match in the history um, South Africans will argue that the 438 match is still the best 50 over match in the history of one day internationals. That brings an end to my presentation for this evening. Uh, we shall now go into revision questions, which are all related to the four laws that Abdullah and I have presented. Um, Abdullah, I'm going to ask you to help me in uh, telling how many hands are up and who's going to help me answer these questions. So the first question has to do with uh, the last hour. And we are going to be calculating how many overs are left to be bowled after a rain interruption. So the last hour starts at 1700 and obviously should end at 1800. Uh, 10 minutes into the last hour, after 2.2 overs have been bowled, there is a rain interruption. Play resumes at 17.23. So the exam question requires you to show step-by-step -step calculations to determine how many overs remain to be bowled in the last hour. And what I'm going to do, Abdullah, is if we've got enough hands, I'm going to ask questions sort of step by step that will lead us to get the four marks required. And the first question is, according to law, how many overs need to be bowled in the last hour? That will be the first part of this calculation. Uh, Tom, we have one hand so far, Bavis. Can you unmute your mic? And tell Tom how many overs um, to be bowled according to law in the last hour, please. Um, good evening, um, Abdullah and Tom. Uh, in, the last, uh, in last over, minimum 20 overs to be bowled. Minimum 20 overs to be bowled, Bavesh. That is perfect. And um, Abdullah, if we have another hand up, that's great. If not, maybe... Yes, we do have another hand up. Uh, Sasikant. Fantastic. So the next part of this question is how many overs have we lost? So we need to take the time that has been lost and we need to calculate that into overs. Uh, good evening. Yes, Shashikan. Uh, so what we'll do, uh, 1723 minus uh, 1710, that's 13 minutes lost. So 13 divided by 3 is uh, 4 point uh, something. So yes. we add 1 to it. So 5, five overs has been lost. So 5 plus 2 is 7. So 20 minus 7 is 13 hours to be bold. Okay, um, Shashikant, just remember 
that the law says for every full three minutes, you will lose one over. So do you want to just redo that calculation as to how many overs are lost? Then I think it's 13 divided by three is four. So four, four overs will be lost then. That's correct. So 13 divided by three is 4.33. So that fifth, we didn't, we didn't get a full three minutes for that fifth over, okay? So yes, sir. We, al we always want to have more cricket, so we are losing less overs. We're rounding 4.33 down to four overs lost. OK, so uh, time lost 13 minutes, overs lost 13 divided by three is equal to 4.33. Round down to four overs for one over for every full three minutes. And then if we've got a last hand, Abdullah, um, how many overs do we have left in the last hour? No, Tom, we do not have any other hands raised. Um, actually, we do. Great. Sandy Yonker, if you can unmute your mic. Yes. The floor is yours. <laughs> I'll try. So, um, Hello, Sandy. Hello, hello. So we lost four overs. So we we had 20 overs available. We bowled 3.2 overs. So um, we've already bowled 2.2 overs. Then we have to take away uh, so one of those overs. Sorry. So um, that's, if I take away the two balls of the one over, I have to add another four balls to make one over there. Okay. Keep the four to, balls, keep the four balls as is. Keep the four balls as is. Okay, to complete an over which counts as one of the last overs. Correct, so, we need to complete that over. Yeah, so so it um <laughs> this is I'm probably gonna get it wrong, but I say twenty minus um 20 minus 2 is 18, minus the 4 overs is um, 14 overs, but I've still got uh, 2 balls of 1 and 4 of another. So um, I've actually got to bowl 3.4 overs plus the 2.2 .2 overs. Is that correct? Um, so you're on the right track, Cindy. Yeah. I'm probably oh. muddled in my explanation. <laughs> so. Yeah. So I think I get I think I get to 14 overs left. OK, so so your answer can be uh, 14 point something because you've only bowled 2.2 .2 overs, right? Um, so remember that you don't lose part of an over. We've we've lost 20 over. Oh, sorry, we've lost four overs. Yeah. Uh, we've, so we've bowled. Lost, yeah. We've We've bowled 2.2 .2 overs. So what's four? Uh, so 2.2 .2 plus four, yeah. effectively 6.2 overs have gone, yeah. and we need to bowl 20. So 20 minus 6.2 will leave you with. Let's just have a look. See. We'll leave you with 13.4 Sorry, sorry, 13.4. And the point 0.2 and the point 0.4 count as one of the over. That's, so that's why that's, they included. That's correct, yeah. Okay. So that's the that's the last line there. Um, you start with 20 overs. You've bowled, I would put the 2.2 .2 first because that happened before the loss of the four. So 20 minus 2.2 .2 minus 4 is equal to 13.4 overs left in the last hour. OK, does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yes. Thanks, then. Excellent. Let's move on to our next revision question, which is also to do with the last hour. And it is now to do with an change of innings in the last hour. 
and uh, you'll remember that Abdullah mentioned we need to make two calculations, uh, one time-based calculation and one overs-based calculation, and uh, we choose the higher of the two uh, as our answer in terms of how many overs are left in the last hour. So let's read this question in full, and then I will ask for two volunteers, one to do the time-based calculation and one to do the overs-based calculation for me. And then uh, we will obviously uh, choose the higher number of overs left as the answer. But in your answer, as you see for five marks, you would need to show both calculations. And then the fifth mark is for the choosing the high of the two calculations. The last hour starts again at 1700 hours. 19 minutes into the last hour after five overs have been bowled, team A is bowled out, with team B now requiring 70, 64 runs to win the match. Show step-by-step -step calculations to, to, to determine how many overs remain to be bowled in the last hour. And if I'm not mistaken, the first calculation is on the overs remaining. Abdullah, can we please have a nominee or a volunteer to take us through um, the overs calculation in terms of how to calculate how many overs left in the last hour? And I'm going to turn back to the question so that they can see the times and the overs. Uh, Tom, we have three hands raised at the moment. I'm going to give firstly the opportunity to Hans, who has not answered a question uh, this evening yet. So Hans, if you can unmute your mic, um, the floor is yours. Uh, good evening, Tom and Abdullah. Okay, I'm uh, based on the number of hours left. Uh, we have to bowl 20 hours in the last hour. At 17, 19, five hours have been bowled already. And now the team is bowled out. So um, we have to take off the five hours from the 20 hours. And then uh, for the change of innings, we have to conduct another three hours, which leaves you with 20 minus five minus three, which means there's 12 hours left to be bowled. <laughs> That is 100% correct for the overs calculation. Um, there it is in red, 20 minus 5 minus 3 is equal to 12 overs left to be bold as per the overs calculation. Well done, Hans. Abdullah, can we have another volunteer for the time calculation, please? And again, I'll go back to the slide that shows the times. Uh, yeah, Tom, we have two hands raised at the moment, Sasikan and Cindy, but Sasikan's hands was, uh, hand was raised first. So Sasikan, over to you. Uh, Sasikant, can you unmute yourself, please? Uh, sorry, I can't get it. Can you give it to Cindy, please? Oh, yes, um, uh, Cindy. Um, so, so Sasikant, pass the ball to you. <laughs> no, I, I, don't, I, I don't want to actually do the calculations. I wanted to just ask a question. Um, in, when a team bowls out for 20 overs, this is... You say after five overs, but what if they've been bowled out after 5.2 overs? So do the, do the balls of the next over count here, or where do we draw the line as next over? Uh, good question, Cindy, uh, and we'll take uh, more questions at the end. Uh, but because we are here now, I'll, I will take you through that. In, in the last hour calculations, when it comes to um, change of innings, uh, that part over 
will actually um, not count as a full over. So you would actually, if they had bold 5.2, you would still say 20 minus 5. Even though, even if they had bold 5.5 overs, you would say 20 minus 5. This is for you to get in uh, more cricket at the end of the day. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit of an odd one where you uh, are, are not considering part of an over as a full over, because in all other parts of uh, the law, you, you do consider a part over as a full over. Uh, but in this part of the law, you consider you don't consider a part over as a full over. So you would still have 20 minus 5 minus 3, which is 12 overs left to bowl. Thank you. Uh, um, Tom, if I can add something to your answer, please. Sure. Uh, the law actually guide us on exactly how to uh, how to do the calculation if there is a part over. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please, Tom. Yeah. So when you do your calculations, and you're based on overs remaining. So the first bullet point is the law tells us that you need to write down the number of overs, including the balls, remaining to be bowled. Now let's use an example. Let's say we started with 20 and side team A was bowled out um, after 3.4 overs was bowled. So the innings ended after 3.4 overs was bowled. So bullet point number one tells us, first thing, how many overs, including the balls, are remaining in the last hour? So 3.4 overs was bowled when the innings ended. So you take your 20 and you subtract the 3.4 overs from your 20. So you now sit with 16.2 16, 16 overs. Now you've covered bullet point number one. So 16.2 overs left of the last hour remaining. Now you go to bullet point number two. So the, now the law tells us if this is not a whole number, round this number up to the next whole number. So is 16.2 a round number? No, it's not a round number. So round it up to the next whole number. So what is the next whole number from 16.2? 17. And now bullet point number three, deduct three overs for the change of innings interval from this number 17. So now in this, uh, in, in your over, overs based calculation, you'll now take 17 minus three. So to answer your question, uh, Cindy, you will need to apply the first two bullet points. Firstly, number of overs remaining that needs to be built, including the balls. And if it's not a whole number, you round it up to the next whole number. So in our example, it was 16.2 left. 16.2 is not a whole number. Round 16.2 up to the next one, which is 17. Thanks, uh, thanks Tom. Over to you. Thanks, Cindy. Thanks, Dula. We're still looking for a volunteer for the time-based calculation. Yeah. Tom, we do have um, Sibonio. Sibonio, if you can unmute yourself and the floor is yours. Good evening to everyone. Uh, what I think uh, about this time time calculation is uh, the last time we have uh, 60 minutes and they have already played 19 minutes. So if we take 60 minutes, uh, subtract uh, 19 minutes, we get uh, 41 minutes. And then there is a interval of 10 minutes. 41 minus 10 minutes, we get uh, 31 minutes. So if we take 31 minutes, we, we divide by three, three minutes, we shall have uh, 10 point something of us, and then we round uh, to the whole number, which will be 11 of us. That's what I think. Thanks. Sibonio, that was a textbook answer. Uh, very well done. Uh, so what's important here is we uh, 
deduct the uh, time left uh, or what is the time and when the change of innings happens, it's 1719. Uh, take 1800 minus 1719. We've got 41 minutes minus 10 minutes for the change of innings gives us 31 minutes. And then we say three minutes per over gives us 10.33 overs. And we always want more cricket, so we round that up to 11 overs. Abdullah, do we have uh, one more hand to now tie up this question and tell us which of those two calculations we are going to use and how many overs we're going to tell the teams are left in the last hour? Uh, yes, Tom, we have four hands, uh, but Bavis's hand was raised first. So Bavis, if you can unmute yourself and tell us which of the two answers we are going to use? Uh, we are going to go ahead with the greater side, which is a 12 overs. And we will inform that the 12 over needs to be bought for the next uh, uh, next remaining uh, duration. Perfect, Vavesh. Thank you very much to all of you for the input on this question. That is a total of five marks. Two marks for the overs calculation, two marks for the time calculation, and the fifth mark is to decide which is the what the the one of the which is the greater of the two calculations. And quite obviously, twelve is greater than eleven, so that is the answer we're going with. Thank you all. Moving on to question three, and it's a pretty straightforward one based on declaration and, sorry, the um, follow on. Team A scores 600 in their first innings of a three day provincial match. They bowl out their opposition for 450 in their first innings. The captain of Team A informs you that he wants Team B to follow on. What is your response? So this is a three day match and we have a lead and team A wants to enforce the follow on. Can they do so? Do we have any volunteer, Abdullah? Uh, yes, Tom, we've got about six, seven hands, but I'm going to give those um, an opportunity that hasn't answered tonight. So, um, Abuta Nazmi, if you can unmute yourself and give us the answer, please. Hi, good evening, Tom, Abdullah, evening all. Yes, um, I would say if the captain agrees, um, yes, they can follow on, uh, follow on because um, in the three or four day um, match, um, the run should be 150 feet. Okay, the lead needs to be a minimum of 150, uh, which it is. And um, it's not really an agreement, Nazmi. It's whether the captain of team A wishes to enforce the follow on or not. OK. Thank you, Tom. You're welcome. So quite right. Minimum lead of 150 runs and which is what we have exactly 150 runs. And yes, the captain of team A can enforce the follow on. Again, just remember that it is an option for them to enforce the follow on. They are not uh, obliged to enforce the follow on. Next question, question four deals with overthrows. Uh, let's read through it and I will need one volunteer for this answer. The striker hits the ball to mid wicket and the batters set off for a quick single. The mid-wicket fielder picks up the ball and tries to run out the striker at the bowler's end. At the instant of the throw, the batters have crossed. The ball misses the stumps and goes over the cover boundary as the batters complete their fourth run. Discuss and explain the procedure to follow. 
Abdullah, do we have a volunteer to take us through this overthrow? Number of runs and who is going to um, face the next delivery, assuming that it's still the same over? Uh, yes, Tom, we have two hands, um, Hans and Sassikant, um, but Hans's hand was raised first. So Hans, if you can unmute your mic, the floor is yours. Hey Tom, so, so the law says that if there's a run in progress, um, you have to look at the instant of the throw. So, um, so they have crossed for the first run and the, the fielder then throws the ball. So you would allow them the one run plus the four for the boundary. Um, it doesn't matter how many they run after that. Um, so I, I assume in this case the ball trickled over the boundary. But you will only allow the one run, the four for the boundary that has been scored, because you have to look at the moment that the ball has been thrown. Uh, and that was after the first run was completed. That was after the batters crossed for the first run. Okay. Just to complete the answer, who is going to face the next delivery? Is it the striker of this, this previous delivery or is it the non-striker who's going to now be the striker for the next delivery? Because they only completed the, the, the one completed run will count, it would then be the non-striker that will face the next delivery. Quite correct, Hans. Well done. Here's the textbook answer. If the boundary results from an overthrow or the willful act of a fielder, the runs scored shall be any runs for penalties awarded to either side. Guys, just remember that in your answers as well. That's always a bonus mark. Um, the allowance for the boundary, as well as the runs completed by the batters together with the run in progress, if they had crossed at the instant of the throw or the willful act. So in this case, we will have four runs for the boundary and we will signal that boundary four. And then we'll have one run as the batters crossed, had crossed by the, at the instant of the throw. So the total is five runs. We need to, after we've signaled the boundary, signal five to the scorers by holding up an open palm uh, facing your chest below your head height. Uh, so your the back of your hand is facing the scorers and you need to wait for acknowledgement from the scorers. OK. Um, what's not on here, Hans, is uh, who's going to face the next delivery, but it's also a good idea in these questions to add that. Just in case you are on 78% and we need one or two more marks to push you to 80%, uh, those extra bits of information will count in your favor. Next question, question five. Uh, this is to do with an overthrow again. On the fifth ball of the 50th over, team B requires five runs to win. Uh, the striker who is on 85 runs is currently batting with the number 10. Apologies, this is not an overthrow. This is a deli delivered short runs. The striker hits the ball towards the cover boundary and starts to run. The batters complete one run, but you as the bowler's end umpire notice that the striker purposefully ran short at the bowler's end when turning for the second run. Explain your actions and the procedure to follow. This is worth five marks. Abdullah, if we can have one person to take us through the entire procedure for five rounds, please. Sorry for five marks. Tom, we have two hands that are raised. The first one was uh, Cindy. Cindy, if you can unmute yourself and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so the uh, umpire will call and signal a dead ball inform the other umpire um uh, then the bowlers empire umpire will dis disallow runs to the batting side return the batters to the original end um call a no ball of or a wide if applicable 
um, and signal five penalty runs to the fielders, inform the scorers and inform the captains. And afterwards, together, the umpire shall report the two to the uh, Cindy, I am putting up the official answer as you speak. And you have pretty much given it word for word. Uh, very well done. Uh, I'm not sure if you mentioned signal noble or wide to the scorers, if applicable. Again, that's another one of those bonus point marks that you can get or you will be given if we are looking for marks to get you over the 80% pass mark. Uh, what you do not get uh, marks for in the exam is uh, inform and report. Um, it's obviously good to know uh, in terms of on-field practice, uh, but unfortunately they consider it too easy to give you a mark for inform and report. Uh, but well done, Cindy, very thorough. And um, what, what's also interesting is on the memo here, they've got call and signal short run. Um, but in the law, as we saw earlier, and as I've confirmed um, on my uh, app with the laws on it, um, the umpires actually don't call and signal short run for if they consider that a deliberate short run has been ran. Um, however, um, yeah, I'm not sure why it is then on the memo, but you'll see that there are five marks if you don't write that first and the last sentences. One, two, three, four, five. Next question. Um, can um, I, sorry, while I've got you. Yes. Can you, just, can you just clarify a point? Sorry, I, I've been putting my hand up and down to try and clarify this, but I know there are lots of us. Just going back to the runs in the last hour, you got mm. a, a, a 10.33 and you said you rounded up. But is that not technically incorrect? Because it's 10 overs and there's one minute remaining. So because it's part of a minute, you then add another over. It's not because you've got 10.33 that you then round it up. It's because you've got a remaining minute or two of the next. And then you add the over onto that. Because otherwise, you're saying you're rounding it up to 11 overs, but there's one minute going. There's still one minute from the 31 minutes over. So now if you round it up to 11 overs, now do you still add the other over for the extra minute that stayed behind? Uh, that extra minute, you are going to bowl an extra over effectively, Cindy. Yes, I know. Um, so, so, but, but then if you, the way you've got it written here, you say 31 divided by 3, 10.33, round it up to 11 overs, but there's one minute remaining of the 30 minutes for those 10 overs. So we're going to add an over on for that. But the way it's written here, you're saying round it up to 11 overs. Then there's a minute. So it's actually you're adding now, because you've rounded it up, you've got to 11. But you've got one minute remaining. So now you've got an add an over to that. You're going to get to 12 overs. No, effectively what we're saying is that we are uh, going to use 33 minutes instead of 31 minutes. 11 times 3 is 33. Okay, but, all right. um, but can you see that if you just say 10.33 here and you say round it up, then you're rounding it to 11, when are you adding that extra over? Are you adding it now or do you round it down to 10 and then add it? Because the one you're going to get 11 over is the one you're going to get 12 over. As I understand it is, and I don't know if it's right, that's why I'm asking the question, that you, you get 31 divided by 3 is 10.33, okay? But yeah. it's 10, 10 overs times 3 minutes is 30 minutes. You're left with one minute. Because it's part of three minutes, you add another over and you get 11 overs. Yeah. But but if you 
do it this way around. You say you've got 10.33, you round it up to 11. I've still got that minute. Then I take and add an over, and I've actually got 12 overs. No, I think you're confusing yourself there, Cindy. Um, or, or, or the wording that we've written is confusing you. Uh, just know that any part of a minute will be a full over. Now, I understand all of that, but it's just the way, the way you've got it written here that, uh, is that I understand it to be 10 and one minute remaining, so you add one over for that, so you get to 11. Perfect. But if that, you, if that's yeah, the way you understand it, then, then, then. But here you yeah. haven't written. Here you haven't written anything about adding for that extra minute. So just clarifying that you don't add it after. You don't round up and then add the minute. You actually round down and then add the leftovers. I think whichever way uh, makes you understand that for every part any part of three minutes you add an over um, whatever helps you understand that that's the way you should understand it but not to the rounded up figure okay so so yeah i'm not saying you should add to the rounded up figure yeah oh, okay that's just what i i just wanted to double check thank you cool. So we only had five revision questions for this evening. And so now I'm going to go to the chat box and check to see what questions we have. Um, the last question of the revision questions we were going through earlier uh, Leslie writes, extending lunch by 30 minutes, should it not be to postpone lunch by 30 minutes to see if the lunch, if the 10th wicket can be taken before breaking for lunch? Uh, that's correct, uh, Leslie. Apologies for that um, sort of, you know, terminology is very, very sticky in, in law, um, so you're quite right. We are not extending the lunch break by 30 minutes. We are delaying it by 30 minutes to try and get that 10th wicket. Obviously, if the 10th wicket falls within that 30 minutes, then we take lunch at the fall of the 10th wicket. Question from Shashikant on the last hour. Um, what time do we record? Is it when the umpire has crossed the boundary? And I think uh, this one was written when Abdullah was explaining about uh, the resumption of play after an interruption. It's uh, when we call a uh, play, Shashikant, uh, that is when we say that play has resumed. Um, so, for example, in the last revision question that we've dealt with now, um, I think the interval was at 1719 so the umpires will come back after the change of innings at 1726 or maybe earlier uh, to make sure that they call play at 1729 so that the interval for change of innings is only 10 minutes so your time is always recorded when you call play uh, not when the uh, umpires cross the boundary rope. Um, Cindy has uh, written about what happens to part of an over. I think we've dealt with that in a fair amount of detail. Um, so hopefully we've cleared that up for you. Um, and Cindy, just in terms of our protocols for uh, the way our sessions work, is that we go through the presentations first, then we go through the revision questions, and then we go and take questions on the chat box. And then if 
you still have any questions afterwards, then you raise your hands to ask any other questions which we will answer. OK. Um, so that is all that was in the chat box. I see hands are still up. Uh, Bavesh, is that an old hand from answering uh, revision questions or is that a question that you have to ask? If it is a question, please unmute your microphone and go. Uh, I have a question regarding the last over 20 overs. Uh, if, if, if there is, a, a, let's say, a session or, or um, the time should last over from uh, 4 o'clock until 5 o'clock, 5 p.m., and there was a wicket down and, and, and uh, overs are completed, 20 overs, but there was a wicket at uh, 16.57 and the new batsman has to come. The over has not been completed. Still three balls has to be bowled. And there is a three minutes left to five o'clock to, to conclude the, uh, the game of day five. However, that batsman took longer time and the time has passed 1700 hours. As an empire, do you still allow that batsman to come on strike and let the over complete? Or do you conclude it now the time is out? You can uh, conclude the game. Abdullah, you want to take that one? Better coming in uh, three minutes before the completion of the last hour, but only getting to the wicket uh, at the close of play time at 1800. Still three balls left in the last hour's minimum of 20 hours. So, Pavis, you need to bowl a minimum of 20 overs in the last hour. So you need to come to in the game or for the game to be done, minimum of 20 needs to be bowled. So yes, uh, a wicket fell with a few minutes or three minutes left uh, before the uh, scheduled closing tab of five. But we need to complete the over so that a minimum of 20 overs are bowled in the last hour. So to answer your question, if there are three balls left in the over, the, the new batter needs to come in and face the three balls. Did um, I answer your question, you. Bavis? Uh, not exactly. Uh, my question was that uh, the fielding team already did the 20 overs. Yeah. So for example, so 21 over 0.3. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, now I understand. So, yeah. So, Bavis, we need to take it from when the wicket fell. So, the wicket fell at sixteen fifty-seven. So, there are there are still time left in in the last hour, and because this this is the last hour of um the last hour of let's say the fifth day, so it's not official closing time yet. So he's, so the new batter still needs to to come in. OK. Understood. So he still have to come even though if one minute's here or there, and then after completion of that particular over, then Empire can conclude the, the game. Then he can conclude, uh, yes. Thank you. Are you welcome? Good question, Bavesh. Thank you. Uh, next hand up is uh, Musa. Musa, uh, please unmute your microphone and the floor is yours. Uh, good evening, um, Tom. Good evening, Abdullah and everybody. I got a little bit confused with um, revision question number four, where um, it talks about the striker playing the ball to the um, covers. And at the point it said, turning after the fourth run not the first when the ball reaches the boundary uh, they are completing their fourth run yes okay so. now, now um, we said the boundary will be scored together with um, the runs completed they had completed three and this is the fourth run so i just got a little bit confused 
So shouldn't be uh, shouldn't it be the boundary plus the four runs that have been completed? Um, no, uh, you need to read that sentence in its entirety. It says the runs completed by the batters together with the run in progress. If they had crossed at the uh, instant of the throw, uh, maybe the, the better word to use there is um, together with the run in progress at the instant of the throw. So let's if together, sorry, together with the run in progress, if they had crossed at the instant of the throw or the willful act. So that's that's actually fine. Uh, but maybe what needs to be added is the runs completed by the batters before the instant of the throw together with the run in progress. If they had crossed at the instant of the throw. OK, so it's not the runs completed after the instant of the throw or when the ball crosses the boundary. It's the runs completed before the instant of the throw, as well as the run in progress if that they had crossed for that run at the instant of the throw. I hope I'm making sense. Well, um, I have to try and understand it and read it over, but According to the statement, they said the ball misses the stump and goes over the cover boundary as the batters complete the fourth run. So it means they had run three. So at the instance of the throw, they had completed the fourth run. No, no. At the instant of the throw is when the ball leaves the fielder's hand. Do you understand that? Yeah. Okay. So. Be, when the ball left the field of hand, the batters have crossed for the first run. Maybe we should have added that to the question. The batters have crossed for the first run. Okay. Okay. And then, yeah. and, then the, and then the ball goes past the stumps and it, like Hans said, it trickled towards the boundary, the cover boundary. So, um, after the ball had missed the stumps, then they completed the first run, then they completed the second run, they completed the third run, and they've even completed the fourth run as the ball goes over the boundary. But the important part is when the ball left the fielder's hand, where were the batters? They had just crossed for the first run. That is why you only award the one run for the running plus the boundary for the ball crossing the boundary. Yeah, I get it now. I understand. Thank you very much. OK, great stuff. Uh, let me unshare again and go back to the Candidates, uh, Cindy, you've got your hand up next. Uh, please unmute your microphone and uh, the floor is yours. I beg your pardon? Uh, that's a mistake. Uh, uh, uh. That's from previous. OK, no problem. Thank you, Cindy. And Thank you to all of you for all of the questions. I'm just going back to the chat box to see if any more questions have been posted. It doesn't look like they have been. I see Cindy, your hand is up again. Is that? Another mistake. <laughs> okay. Oh, get it down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It, it down. Maybe it's just you waving good good night and goodbye. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for all of your input and interaction this evening. Um, I hope you've all learned and your questions have been cleared. 
um, there's a fair bit of uh, sort of uncertainty in uh, some of the overthrows as well as the last hour calculations. I um, suggest that you all go through these revision questions on your own again. Uh, check the recording for the answers. And if you still have any doubts, um, you can always email uh, myself or Abdullah, or you can WhatsApp me. I will be sending out the recording for this lecture in the next couple of hours, and uh, it will be on YouTube. Uh, those of you who don't know, we've got a newly established uh, YouTube channel, uh, so please subscribe to it and you'll get notification every time we post uh, anything on our YouTube channel. Uh, we won't only just be posting level one, level two, level three lecture recordings. And in On the 17th of September, we're going to have a refresher course for Western Province Cricket Umpires Association members um, and we will be having a uh, on-field practical for uh, setup and also getting into position for runouts at the bowlers end and uh, we hope to record that and post that video also on our YouTube channel so keep an eye on our YouTube channel for for more videos not just uh, recordings of lectures. I want to take this opportunity to wish you all a very good evening and enjoy the rest of your night. We shall reconvene on Wednesday when we will be going through more laws. Until then, keep well, keep safe. Thank you and good night. Thanks, Tom and Abdullah. Time and over. Have a good evening, everyone.